A very warm welcome to you all. This webcast is part of the St Anthony's Looks at the World series. The topic of discussion today will be around environmental sustainability, green energy, socio-economic policy and regulation and climate justice. We have an absolutely fantastic panel for the discussion today. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our chair, Dr. Manal Shihabi, to you. Dr. Manal Shihabi is an academic visitor at St Anthony's, senior research fellow at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies and research associate at the Economic Research Forum. She is founding director of Shear Research and Advisory Limited and a recognized expert on economic and energy transition in Gulf oil producers. She is also a recognized expert with the UNFCCC on economic diversification and response measures to climate change. Her research has impacted policymaking at various levels and is published in numerous high impact journals, books and policy reports. She co-authored a report presented at COP26 on quantifying effects of response measures on developing countries. I'll now hand over to Manal, who will introduce our panel of speakers today, all of whom are alumni of St Anthony's College. Thank you very much, Jane. It is my absolute pleasure to be with you all today and welcome to everyone. And it is also my great pleasure to introduce a wonderful panel uh, that we have with us, all of whom are um, fantastic alumni of St. Anthony's doing amazing things uh, around the world um, on sustainability and climate change. Um, we first have uh, Michael Manulak, who is an assistant professor at the Norman Peterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. Um, his main work is on international organizations, uh, global environmental politics, diplomacy, and foreign policy, including when it comes to geopolitical dynamics uh, in environmental governance. He is also has a forthcoming book, which is expected to come out later this year, uh, around May, um, uh, on uh, the title of which is Change in Global Environmental Politics, Temporal Focal Points, and the Reform of International Institutions. Um, and this book covers international continuity and change in the history of global environmental politics. Uh, we're very happy to have you with us today, uh, Michael, and to um, have your expertise, particularly when it comes on uh, what pertaining to international uh, governance and uh, geopolitical issues and everything at the international level as well. Next, we have Sahara Mehroz, uh, who is um, an expert in environmental journalism, uh, as well as in climate finance and youth engagement in climate action. Uh, she is a Bangladeshi freelance environmental journalist and development professional who has been working as the head of solutions mapping, uh, but she also has worked with the UNDP uh, as well as with uh, the uh, government in Bangladesh. Uh, parts of her work has been also designing a project on enhancement, enhancing women's adaptive capacity to climate change in coastal areas. And she recently shot a video documentary for Al Jazeera on off-grid solar electrifications in remote areas in Bangladesh. Um, and she has also uh, been very active in international organizations, including World Economic Forum and uh, COP uh, in various years as well. Um, great to have you here and welcome uh, Sahara as well. And finally, for our last uh, panelist and speaker, we have uh, Wako Yokoyama, uh, who is uh, working on issues surrounding rare metal mining, issues of renewable energy, as well as uh, non-perspective uh, solutions. Um, while at the um, award setting here at St. Anthony's, she also wrote a thesis on the localization of lithium mining, as well as the socio-environmental impacts uh, of that on climate justice, um, and how uh, we can make that concept uh, with more, uh, have more positive opportunities um, uh, in mining uh, and on socioeconomic impacts as well in general. Uh, currently, she's a policy analyst at GEMSERVE and she works on areas focusing on energy efficiency and low um, carbon uh, energy. Um, and um, she was also um, the graduate environmental officer for uh, St. Anthony's College. Welcome for the three of you. So we'll start maybe um, kind of with an, an overarching um, common theme here about the difficulty when it comes to our topic today, environmental sustainability uh, and climate change and green energy. Um, obviously climate change is an issue that is very global. 
Um, it affects all countries because it's resulting from human activity over the years and, 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 and industrial revolution. Um, but then when it comes to how it affects countries, obviously it affects it at a very different level, country by country. And then uh, mitigating climate change as well as adapting to climate change also happens at the uh, domestic level. So we have really kind of a discrepancy between something that happens internationally and has international organizations that try to regulate it, but then the implementation and effects of that come at the very um, um, domestic level. And needless to say, there's often discrepancy also between um, national and international policy making and regulations. And um, if I could start maybe our discussion, maybe with taking it from this high level at the global macro level, and then kind of going slightly down the hierarchy to more maybe the local level. Just Michael, um, if I could start with you, um, maybe you could take us a little bit briefly through the development of global environmental politics. Um, you know, a bit of a, you, you work, obviously, your expertise is on, is on the history of that, um, but maybe also what your opinion is in terms of what has worked um, uh, and what hasn't when it comes to global environmental politics. Yeah, thank you and welcome. Uh, it, I'm delighted to be on the panel and to, uh, to participate and meet the, the other panelists as well. Uh, really looking forward to the discussion. Um, 2022 is a big year in global environmental politics. It's the 50th anniversary of the 1972 Stockholm Conference, in many ways the, the starting point for multilateral environmentalism, and also uh, the 50th anniversary of the, the birth of the UN Environment Program. And so this is, this is a, a really kind of opportune time for reflection on where we are, where we've come from, and where we're going. Um, in terms of what, uh, what has worked, what hasn't worked, I, I mean, the international community, I think, has a decidedly mixed record on tackling global environmental problems um, over, over the 50 years uh, that they've been trying to do so in a, in a particularly organized way. Um, there's some notable successes like the, uh, the Montreal Protocol and efforts to tackle uh, stratospheric ozone and the depletion of that. Um, there have been some significant progress on tackling uh, certain pollution on a broad international basis, regional seas and, and so on, and, and a number of other uh, successes. Uh, unfortunately, um, those, those successes have sometimes been uh, preceded by fairly long periods, uh, both before and after those successes of, of, um, of, of perhaps less stellar progress on, on tackling uh, a lot of important environmental problems. Um, and so um, I think in terms of what, what has worked and when the international community has really been galvanized to tackle these problems, uh, we saw at the 1972 Stockholm Conference, a real leap forward, we, the 1992 Rio Earth Summit and certain other uh, cases where uh, states have really gathered and, and, and made some progress. And I think um, UN environmental institutions have been most successful when they've served as a, as a platform for engagement among a very wide array of actors um, in, in the international community, uh, whether they're, they're civil society organizations, whether they're businesses, whether they're, uh, but also, you know, regional governments, municipal governments, um, as well as uh, governmental actors that are not typically at the table when we come to negotiate. And those, um, those uh, we often would think that those, uh, that all of those actors come together to make a momentous decision, but but actually, um, a lot of times it's actually the reverse that ends up happening. It's when all of those actors, when there is a kind of concerted view that we need to do something on the environment, that we are able to achieve those big breakthroughs in, in global talks. And so I think that those are, are really uh, fundamental to, to our ability to, to generate the broad-based um, uh, capacity to, to tackle a lot of the uh, oftentimes long-standing environmental problems facing the world community. Um, in terms of what hasn't worked, I think... Um, uh, one of the one of the legacies that that we've seen over the fifty years is 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 a kind of bureaucratic inertia that leads to a lot of fragmentation in global environmental governance. Um, in 1972, there were already UN agencies, World Health Organization, UNESCO, the World Meteorological Organization, that sought to kind of preserve their bureaucratic turf, uh, and now even more so with the multilateral, the, the you know the very distinct environmental conventions that we have on biodiversity, on climate, and all of these things that do not reflect the integrated nature of these issues, and so they're all dealt with in a very siloed way that I think uh, limits our capacity to uh, to tackle these problems in the way that we need to. And do you think then also geopolitical um, rivalries, should we say, also then affect our ability to, to achieve uh, our collective targets, whether it's between the US and China or, you know, what we saw with India with the last COP uh, 26 with the, you know, the changing of the language regarding coal, uh, phasing out of coal at the very, very last minute. And do you think that has a, from, from your work, do you think that has a very big impact or is it more 
um, one of the impacts rather than a driving impact? No, I think it, I think it is absolutely it's it's a it's a fundamental problem. States have this this strategic dilemma that that they face in terms of the others, and they don't want to assume too large a share of of the pie, um, while the other you know kind of effectively get the sucker payoff in 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 these negotiations. Um, and I think really it comes down to a capacity to to believe that the other side is engaging as in in as forthright a manner as as they can. Uh, to tackle these problems and and kind of finding a way to unravel that that fundamental strategic dilemma, I think, is is really at the core of of achieving the kinds of breakthroughs that we need to on climate and on other areas of international cooperation in the environmental space. So uh, so I think that that's uh, that's absolutely fundamental, and it's something that we're going to have to get right if we're going to uh, uh, I think meet the uh, the ambition gap on climate uh, in 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 the next few years. Um, because this this decade, I think, is is really the fundamental decade that we that we need to kind of break the back of this climate problem. That we need to 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 really leap forward on climate ambition, and and so I think finding a way to to unravel that that rivalry that's that that uh, unfortunately is is just growing uh, within the international system, um, and and I should say is probably made worse by the situation in Ukraine right now. Yeah, definitely. And I, I would definitely agree that this, um, whatever we do in the next 10 to maybe 20 years is going to be very critical this dec- in, in this century in tackling climate change. But also, I mean, the whole the IPCC report had just come out and there has been, again, once again, agreement among the scientists and policymakers who work in, in climate and the environment, uh, environmental issues, that we really need to significantly cut emissions very quickly and very rapidly if we were to limit uh, global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius by mid-century or so. And I think part of the problem is the significant contributors to that uh, have been, um, you know, as we said, over time, it's really been the richer economies and now also the largest uh, populated economies, China, India, but also the U.S. um, um, and Australia and oil producing economies like those in the Gulf, uh, while the countries that are mostly affected by climate change tend to be developing countries. And there's this big, um, also, it's not necessarily a geopolitical as in between states, but really maybe a big divide between advanced economies and developing economies when it comes to climate governance and negotiations, um, when it comes to climate finance. Um, and, you know, there's this, been this uh, committed $100 billion uh, an annual assistance from the rich, let's call it the rich world to the developing world who are most affected by climate change, um, which um, to, to help with effects of climate change on their economies. But we know that that also has been um, an unresolved issue in recent negotiations. And I kind of want to go from there to uh, maybe if I could engage Sahara a little bit, because um, Bangladesh has been one of the countries most affected by climate change, uh, whether it's from rising uh, uh, sea levels and the temperatures, uh, but also the large size of the vulnerable population who are working in farmings that also have tended to be very largely affected by uh, climate change. We've also seen, you know, women and refugees from the Rohingya community, for example, also uh, being uh, very vulnerable in general, but become more vulnerable with effects of climate change. Um, And I kind of would like to get your thoughts a little bit on what and how Bangladesh has been kind of tackling that not so much from the international level, as we've heard Michael um, give us some insights on, but more from the domestic level, um, at the policy, policy, domestic policy level, and maybe even um, whether it's government or, or group, um, maybe like grassroots effort communities as well. Thank you, Manal, for the question. And it's lovely to hear from everyone. Um, building on what Michael was saying, I think if you kind of uh, go down from that macro perspective to what's happening at a micro level um, in a very vulnerable country like Bangladesh, which is where I am right now, and also my dissertation um, focused on kind of the coastal regions, which are the most climate vulnerable in the country. Um, there is, uh, the good thing is there is a sort of um, appetite and understanding at the policy level for the uh, necessity of urgent climate action. So across the board, across all political parties, like this is the one issue that they kind of all agree on that, yes, we have to invest on climate action. Yes, we have to do something to adapt um, because the uh, effects are so noticeable and millions of people are, their livelihoods are at risk and it's becoming more and more uh, of a severe issue as we see 
increasing frequency and intensity of natural disasters. So I think um, given that context, um, about 10 years ago, um, you know, we saw these climate policies and mainstream of climate change um, into government action becoming um, sort of something that be, uh, became a policy priority. And this, this first was um, sort of, uh, you know, evident when the country uh, set up the uh, Bangladesh Climate Change Strategy and Action Plan, which essentially was a way to um, identify like what were the key areas where the impacts were going to be felt most strongly and how exactly the ministries should shape their programming and budgets to make sure we address adaptation needs in all those different sectors. Um, um, and also building on that, uh, we, we saw that you know, the, the country invested its own money into setting up a climate change trust fund um, where it invested millions of dollars, just a huge chunk of our national budget um, into these, you know, uh, to, to formulate and help um, local level organizations that are um, implementing climate adaptation projects financially. So the country was not only um, sort of making its case at the international levels at the climate conferences and such, but at the same time, it didn't, uh, you know, stay limited at that, but invested its own resources to build its adaptation um, at the at the at, at the at the areas where the effects were most strongly felt. So um, what we saw is like, in addition, there's also um, an institutional institutional arrangements were set in place and a coordinated strategy made for sort of mid and long term climate change adaptation uh, planning. Um, and the, the most recent thing is the country is setting up a national adaptation plan, um, which is extremely important because there are so many ministries sort of working in silos and you kind of have to um, bring a coordinated approach if you are really to engage with um, the multitude of impacts that climate change uh, continue to bring. And we see the Ministry of Environment and Forest, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Planning, um, they're all coming together to form the this national level, um, you know, national adaptation plan. And this essentially would um, address the, you know, have relevant programming for adaptation on the most um, vulnerable sectors, like in the water resources, the agriculture and food security, um, the coastal areas where millions of people live who are being forced to migrate to other parts of the country, um, like the urban areas. And as a result, you know, we see these unsustainable levels of urbanization. So essentially, uh, the priority sectors have already been involved and engaged in this national adaptation planning process. So I think um, at the, you know, for, for a top level sort of overview, that's kind of what I can share that you know, the government is doing um, a lot. Of course, there's a lot more that can be done, but at least um, the good thing is that there is that a sense of urgency that yes, we need to do um, a lot more and we're trying what we can, so yeah. Wow, that's, I think it's really important that the different stakeholders, so to speak, and the different ministries are all involved in this because otherwise, as you say, everybody will work in silos. But I'm curious, how is the, where's the funding from the, um, this fund has come from? Is that completely, um, yeah, if you could just maybe shed light on that. Right. So there were two, uh, initially, there were two funds that were set up. Um, the uh, There was one fund called the Bangladesh Climate Change uh, Resilience Fund. That was, uh, there was some support from the World Bank and, and, and a few other international donors. But uh, the Bangladesh Climate Change Trust Fund was essentially set up by the government using its own money. So it was completely domestic resources. Um, mm -hmm. And the trust fund already has like over 200 adaptation projects being implemented all over the country. Um, and yeah, so I think while there is a need and there is that a narrative that we do need more funding from all these institutions like the Green Climate Fund and Adaptation Fund and whatnot, but at the same time, the country is also stepping up with its own resources. Wow, that's wonderful. Um, and I, I also really like the grassroots effort as well, particularly, you know, when you find really uh, what we, I guess you could call um, community-based solutions, so to speak, for particular problems, even if the international funding is necessarily lacking, right? Uh, but I also, um, I'm aware that Bangladesh is still far from achieving its, its targets, but in the world in general is also far in achieving the targets. Um, and um, I think one way that we can, we know that this is gonna be possible is to um, implement or use more decarbonization technology to kind of facilitate the move away from fossil fuels to um, um, uh, achieve whether it's renewable energy or new sources of energy. And I know, uh, Sahara, you've covered part of that in renewable energy projects and in remote areas of Bangladesh. Um, and um, Wako, I, if, if I could maybe move to you a little bit now, because um, 
you work particularly on the, the energy uh, transition and, and, and technology part. Um, and obviously decarbonization is becoming increasingly important for achieving uh, climate targets and having the net effect of net zero emissions by uh, middle of the century. Um, could you maybe just give us a bit your thoughts on what the role of energy efficiency and new technologies and low carbon uh, sphere um, in achieving global decarbonization efforts? And we, I'd love to hear that from your research and from the work that you've done. But also, um, uh, if I'm um, correct, you also were at COP26 and maybe could, you could share maybe part of that experience as well with us uh, and with the listeners. Yeah, um, of course. And first of all, thank you for having me, Manel, and thank you for the introduction. Um, so I think for someone to position low carbon technology and energy efficiency in the energy transition. So, as you know, there are a variety of solutions, whether that's nature based solutions, softer solutions. And I'd like to put emphasis on the fact that these solutions are extremely important. And I think it's really important to see that low carbon and energy efficiency has to come into play because it was maybe a hundred years ago that we first discovered the negative impacts that CO2 has on the environment. And it's taking us this long to act upon it. And um, if, you know, if it was a hundred years ago that we started to make some changes slowly and slowly in softer solutions, we might not have needed to bring in um, something like some hard solution like low carbon solutions or low carbon technology. Um, so I'd like to emphasize the fact that we've had to bring in such a hard technology because of our, because it's become urgent now. Um, so kind of branching off from that, um, the role of low carbon technology is basically to replace the current technologies that are polluting um, and to mitigate the issues. Um, but we also really need to be careful in this transition because um, low carbon technology cannot uh, replace and then encourage further consumption. Um, so first of all, starting with energy efficiency, um, about right now 50% of energy appliances, uh, energy used for appliances are wasted and about 70% of the energy being used for motor is wasted. Um, and so you can just imagine that by making these appliances more efficient, we can cut down so much. So that's the first stage. And then secondly, um, building on from this uh, energy efficiency um, implementation in our current system, we can actually um, decrease the energy intensity by 35% um, in our global economy in 2030, if we carried on doing that, um, if we actually implemented energy efficiency um, solutions. It is after that that we can implement low carbon technology because it is important to recognize that we are not replacing unnecessary technology with low carbon, that we're getting rid of those unnecessary um, pollutants. And then we are only replacing what we need and what is necessary with the low carbon. And the reason why I'm saying this is because um, low carbon technology, although they are um, low carbon in its operation, there are other effects that it has in manufacturing and in end of life processes. So it's very important to have these kind of nuance and ensure that the implementation of it is important. Um, perhaps uh, an easy sort of picture is to say that um, EVs are great, but if we replace all EVs, or all um, uh, cars with EVs, and then think that we can carry on buying more EVs. You mean um, electric vehicles. Yeah, electric yeah. vehicles. Then, um, it's not really answering the issue. Um, so this kind of implementation of the solution is as important as the solutions themselves. Um, and your second question about um, COP, I think it was really interesting um, to see, uh, to, to, to meet people with a lot of different perspectives about this from all around the world. Um, 
and to discuss how we've all noticed um, in common that one of the most important things is um, for people to recognize that there's so much that we need to learn. Um, there are people very high up in positions who um, might, you know, um, they also need to be learning a lot more um, in terms of um, environmental change. And so it was the, the element of humility was uh, often uh, repeated amongst discussions, amongst myself and some people that I met there. Yeah, that's um, a very interesting perspective. I think all of us can learn uh, more and more on the effects of, of climate change, but also on what we can do. And I think also you mentioned efficiency and, and technology and it made me, you know, your EV example also made me think of just consumption in general. And, you know, I think Michael had kind of mentioned what, what's happening now or very briefly mentioned the, the crisis in Ukraine. It's also coming, uh, you know, bringing more to the forefront of our thinking how important our consumption patterns are, not only in in really in how much we we demand uh, of energy and of course how much we then consume and and how much we emit in, in terms of um, uh, carbon and also the implications of that on a geopolitical uh, level. Um, but I just had one comment, because um, uh, you also mentioned the uh, negative effects of, of carbon, but we also shouldn't forget that there are positive effects of carbon. We need carbon, right? I mean, the plants need carbon to give us oxygen. Otherwise, um, we um, wouldn't survive. But that's also the crux of, of um, you know, these um, uh, uh, nature-based solutions and, and how we can then incorporate nature to be a sink, so to speak, for a lot of the carbon emissions. I think that also will be an important role. Um, so um, the three of you from three different, very uh, separate but very complementary perspective have kind of really uh, set the stage for, for discussion and given us an, an important idea of where we stand and what can be done. Um, but um, clearly overcoming the challenges um, that the three of you have kind of set up at the three different levels between the global, the domestic, and even the technology um, and private sector side, um, this is an uphill battle. And I was wondering, um, what do you think would be maybe from each of you one of the most critical actions that the community, and I mean the community in the general term, can do uh, to overcome the challenges of achieving our um, climate uh, and sustainability targets? And maybe if I could have, maybe Michael, you could maybe focus on the global regulatory level and then Sahara maybe at the local level and then uh, Waco maybe at the private sector level, perhaps. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think. First, I'll preface. I, I think um, at the global level, we uh, we have made some substantial progress. I don't want to. So I, I point out all of the challenges, but um, if we just think about where we've come since Paris, um, the uh, the the commitments to net zero are you know have been very very rapid. Um, and you mean and the Paris Climate Agreement? The Paris Climate Agreement. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, and uh, you know even at at, at COP twenty six in Glasgow now one point five is is the new two and so uh, we <laughs> actually have seen a a um, a pretty breathtaking um, uh, change in this respect um, but we talked a little bit uh, about some of those those geopolitical dynamics that I think are are, are right. uh, potentially uh, making this a real challenge and and I think um, the key is is to really make that that leap forward in terms of the the level of ambition that that we need. Um, and, um, you know, the, um, at, at COP26, I think, um, um, you know, there, there were some real steps forward, but as, as uh, the former UNFCCC Framework Convention on Climate Change Executive Secretary Christiana Figueres has talked about, we took some real good steps forward, but we, what we really needed was, was a leap. And so, um, uh, so how, do we, how do we get there? Um, and I think I think that you know it's pretty clear that uh, that China needs to peak its 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 emissions much sooner than than it's currently committing. India needs to come to the table in, in a more substantial way than it uh, than it has. Uh, the United States needs to figure out its domestic politics in order to make sure that the commitments that they do make they can actually implement, um, which uh, uh, which as as we all know is is, is a real challenge. Um, I think one of my one of my worries about about the current system though in, in these annual uh, COP. Uh, meetings and even talk about annualizing the ratchet mechanism, uh, so the the uh, the commitments that countries make and making them more of an annualized um, process. 
um, which, which I think on the surface is good. But I think we might be uh, to some extent incentivizing countries to, uh, to leave something in the tank for future, uh, for future meetings and to avoid the, the kind of leap forward that we need if we are going to make the, um, to, to bridge the commitments gap and, and do, it, uh, do it swiftly. Um, and so just have been thinking about, about the process and how we, how we would tackle, uh, tackle this. And I'm increasingly um, coming around to the view that, that we need something actually that, that takes us a little bit out of the COP process and, and perhaps eclipses the COP process, maybe a sort of super COP. Um, where uh, where countries are uh, are able to uh, to to engage and, and we can have a much broader basis of international uh, engagement on these issues even than the cops that we've had because I think um, to some extent it, you know the the UK government really did try to push I think the cop envelope as far as they could with cop 26 and engage and and really uh, push for for greater climate ambition but I think there needs to be a, a step forward that that allows the international actors to uh, to engage uh, with each other and to recognize Recognize that 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 meeting will be where they really need to meet their true bottom lines in terms of uh, in terms of climate uh, finance, in terms of climate mitigation, and and also uh, a real firm uh, commitment to adaptation. That uh, that so far uh, countries I think are are uh, uh, reserving their position to a certain extent, and so um, uh, we need to we need to create a, a structure that that incentivizes countries to. Uh, to really uh, go as far as they could possibly go in terms of their climate commitments. And we need to do this, uh, I think, within the next couple of years. Otherwise, we're going to have a real, um, a real challenge uh, keeping us uh, within 1.5 degrees. Mm. And, and this is very interesting because you said it really goes down to, you know, countries really raising their level of, of commitment and level of ambition. But at the same time, if there's no incentive within the, the global um, framework to incentivize that, then that's going to be a problem. And um, it'll be interesting to see whether that, you know, super cop suggestion that you have will have some sort of incentive for that to, to um um, I think part of the problem is also we're, I think, at a global level, still not seeing uh, the problem of the of, the, of global cl of, of climate change as as a as a, a global problem. It's still when we adapt solutions, it often comes not a, as a, almost a zero sum game when it, when we think of solutions and negotiations at country levels. Um, so, Hara, what would your thinking be about what would be a very maybe the most important action to be done at a local level and maybe tie that to you know whether it's Michael's point on raising ambitions or even implementing existing ambitions which a lot of countries are very f far and behind uh, their own targets to begin with. Yeah I think it's a great question and I've thought about this a lot um, as I've had the opportunity to go to a few cops and kind of you know attend these like never-ending negotiations and discussions and the ambitions don't really go up much it's only the time that you know we are prolonging so I think a key stakeholder group that can really help um, bring that ambition up is like the younger people. Um, I, I don't buy into the narrative that, you know, they are the leaders of the future. I think this is like they need to be the leaders right now. And uh, are we really giving them the capacity and the floor and the space to um, really vocalize their concerns? And this is this when I talk about space, it's not just about, OK, giving them a space in a, a panel discussion for 10 minutes and that's it. But if, let's say, um, a young person is setting up a community-based organization to do something about um, addressing, protecting the mangrove forests in, in his or her coastal village, which are really the first line of barrier against cyclones, are we giving them the institutional support? Are we linking them with government bodies? Are we training them? Are we giving them funding? So I see this a lot because um, as a part of my work as a freelance journalist, I travel to all these different parts of Bangladesh, like talk to all these grassroots organizer, organizers, community organizations, and you know even even NGOs and a lot of them have young people full of hopes and you know dreams and they they don't like they don't necessarily buy in thank God to the narrative that the world's going to end because they think their entire lives are still ahead and they want to do something to have a good life and 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 that's why out of that optimism they want to do a lot more to address climate change and I'm seeing all these like really young boys and girls like you know 13 14 year olds like having these elaborate like awareness campaigns um, training sessions um, climate. Um, awareness, um, you know, sort of practical activities which involve, let's say, um, designing an app which which measures how much your carbon footprint is on a day-to-day -day basis, right. or you know, at the village level, you're seeing people who are really going to the local um, local uh, the lowest tier of the government body, which we call the Union Parisha, the UP, and they're trying to go and say, look, we need more money to protect this part of the road, which is going underwater because of flooding. So can we have some more budgetary allocation for that? So I think the real local action that needs to happen is, are you empowering these young voices which are coming up and these young people who want to do more 
to address the, the climate impacts that they're facing in their own lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that really requires the discussions to happen um, at, at, the, at not just only the country level, which, we, uh, which is happening to some extent, where the government is becoming more and more aware of, of bringing these youth, let's say, into the NAP that I mentioned, the National Adaptation Plan. Some young people's voices have been included in the planning of the NAP. But beyond that, at the global level also, are we really empowering them to make sure the shifts that we need and the level of ambition that we need to achieve, that they can contribute at that to attain that goal to reach 1.5 as well. So I think that needs to happen. Yeah, I think that's really important because obviously the youth are going to be the ones who are going to be living, as you say, the consequences of, of climate change in the future. Uh, but often there's also a problem because even climate change isn't even incorporated in education in most countries. So part of that, I think, would be also incorporating then uh, climate sustainability, environment issues at the at the uh, really at the school level in our educational system to kind of start even kind of awareness, but also encouraging other involvement. But you've also been involved in a voluntary youth organization. Um, I think it was called Clo Global Shapers, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, I'm still involved actually with that. Oh, you are okay, and that has also had basically led youth in in kind of contributing to uh, fighting climate change. Yeah, so we had a very um, interesting um, project, which is called Trillionaire, and this then got scaled up in like five countries through the global network that we we're part of. So essentially, the project was very simple. It was like, okay, given that these young people are going to be um, the leaders, um, you know, in, in like 10, 15 years, and we need people who are more responsible leaders in positions of power, how do we ingrain that sense of, you know, responsibility for the planet from a young age? And we thought like, why don't we gamify this process? Why don't we like sort of take climate action to them instead of expecting them to engage it without having any tools or any support to do so. So essentially the project, what it did was we'd show up to different schools um, and we, we would have these like animations, like little short film, uh, films and clips where we'd show like why climate change matters and kind of bring it down to a level where a young person can understand like what, how it impacts your day-to-day -day lives and then kind of engage them in a small activity like like tree plantation for instance and then making that that person like a guardian of that the plant that you have so in a way like the, the activity itself was a way to instill the sense of guardianship of the planet from a young age um, mm -hmm. through small actions that you can do in your home in your school um, and and therefore the idea being these kids would grow up as more climate conscious citizens so i think that is just one example of a project that we did through the organization and now like afghanistan nepal india uh, pakistan they've all scaled this up through the global shapers network and they're doing it in like thousands of school schools in their countries so i think a lot of good things are happening but again like these initiatives are sort of few and far between and they're not um i think you need to really like, scale up their impact and that needs more support than what a young youth organization can do right right and then i think what's key about that is that these solutions are very local based and they help the local community as well so the the, the youth organizations can then really focus on what could be required for that particular community or particular country um wako what about you what are your thoughts on what would be the main so kind of that same question, what would be the main actions that could be done, perhaps at the private level, take us even further down um, the funnel, so to speak? First of all, I think that the net zero targets and strategies are um, placing uh, private sector to have um, higher ambitions that they had before um, and be a lot more responsible. Um, but I'd also like to take it a step further, um, particularly in terms of uh, the, the minerals and metals side of the conversation, because um, for example, uh, net zero targets and the standards are enabling uh, private sector or car manufacturers to change their supply chain into one that is more sustainable or one that helps them have a clean, uh, greener portfolio. Um, but what that happens, uh, when that happens, um, they often, let's say cobalt, they might switch the cobalt supplier from DRC to somewhere else uh, or switch uh, the, the um, material in general um, into something that is more sustainable for them. But what happens is that the community in the local area uh, that was a part of that mining um, would also be impacted because just because you are diverting your supply from uh, something that doesn't make you look good, just that just means that you've abandoned them. Um, and there are some companies 
um, who are part of this initiative to not only shift their supply chain to a more uh, a cleaner one, but also to ensure that they are going to that community and ensuring that there is support and development. Um, for example, if it's mining, to make sure that um, there is introduction of risk management, um, environmental protocols, and human rights, um, and all of these things that would not abandon them, but help them actually improve um, and help and support them. Um, and so there are some companies that are doing this, uh, some car manufacturers too, but obviously not all companies can afford such a thing. Um, and so I think there should also be um, some kind of incentive reward scheme that will help companies also have the also cover their opportunity costs that they are creating by making that shift that will clean their portfolio and so this is a step further than what is expected um, net zero targets and net zero strategies already a step further from what had been before but i think that um, in order to make sure that we're you know um, cleaning the global north doesn't cause a, a negative impact on the global south um, such initiatives like this is very crucial so when you mention incentives you mean like subsidies to the private sector for um, example yeah, or funding, um, and of course, there's you know the carbon carbon pricing that might be able to create some kind of leveling of the playing field, so that companies have the incentive, almost like offsetting, perhaps. But that's not a, a very good way of placing it, especially in a social impact context. Right. Um, I think part of the difficulty in that also is that there's not even one way in which we can measure all emissions, right? So, and and I'm happy, um, obviously, Sohara and, and Michael um, can also join the conversation in, in terms of how could you then have incentive structure that encourage the private sector, also encourage and work at the international level with, with more international agreement on what is acceptable uh, um, uh, uh, incentive structure that do not necessarily uh, support one country's industry over another um, or um, give advantage for maybe more advanced countries that can have different measurements of, um, of, of or different established processes for, for example, carbon trading uh, over others. Uh, but at the same time, how do we not pass that price to the local customers? Because then consumers are saying, we didn't produce this over time. Why should we pay for it instead of the manufacturers paying for it? If I could um, maybe just build on something that you mentioned Waco at the last in your last answer about how a mining company for example uh, could try to implement solutions to reduce its emissions towards achieving net zero emissions targets but then that how that could affect negatively affect the community that depends on the mining industry um i think this is one of the neglected areas that we often see in general um and this is why we also uh, see resistance for example of countries that depend on coal or oil or gas resistance for uh going away or re the, the global effort to reduce consumption of um of fossil fuels in general towards um renewables or even you know low carbon technology but at the same time low carbon technology and renewables renewables can be quite expensive. Um, and um, then it brings issues of uh, questions of, for example, uh, climate justice. Are we allowing or is there room here for maybe more uh, richer nations to have access to low, clean uh, low carbon technology because they can afford it? while at the same time, for example, we're really cutting the livelihood of, of uh, industries and of populations and communities that depend uh, on uh, uh, more you know, fossil fuel based um, industries or even cannot necessarily afford cleaner energy. I mean, there is over, um, there's still billions of people in the world today without access to clean energy and without access to clean uh, cooking fuel, for example. Um, so there would be really these issues of these unintended um, socioeconomic and socio-environmental implications of, of, um, of climate sustainability. Um, perhaps I could bring Sahara back to maybe from, from your work through your journalism where you're working in Bangladesh, what were example of, um, or examples of successful local community efforts to kind of reduce these negative effects of, of um, uh, mitigation policies 
um, on their local communities? Um, yeah, so just a bit of caveat before, uh, like, you know, contextual clue before going to answering that is our, our carbon emissions are extremely low. I think according to 2019, it was like 0.02% of global carbon emissions come from Bangladesh, which is like nothing given the population is like 170 million people. Right. Um, a big part of that being that, uh, you know, millions of people still don't even have access to energy. Um, mm-hmm. So if I kind of lay out the geography a bit for you, like there are a lot of rivers. And as a result, we have a lot of these like um, little islands which are essentially, it's impossible to bring grid electricity to those parts. It's just like financially not viable. So the people living in these like little islands, which like, you know, appear and disappear depending on the movement of the silt and and the waters, um, they essentially know that they're gonna be living in a place that might not exist in a few years and they'd have to move somewhere else. So no one, like like there's very little financial incentive for, the government or any any company to kind of bring electricity to a place like that mm-hmm. um so that's that, that's part of the reason why like you know like our energy access is a huge issue and and obviously mitigation is not a big uh, priority uh, of the government as of yet um having said that i think they they have decided to cut it down by up to 15 percent from cu- current levels with government uh with international support and i think uh, a little bit less than that without any support at all so i think what is um happening is the, the way the, 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 the reason why renewable energy proliferation is still happening is just because in some cases, it's actually the only option available to people. So um, just if I could give you an example, um, this one startup that I covered um, in the documentary mm-hmm. I made recently, they um, are bringing, uh, they have this innovative model which involves um, peer, uh, like it's a solar power, which can be shared through a peer-to-peer network among, among let's say five houses that are connected through this like soul box um, system that they've built up. And essentially the people who are part of that network can not only make solar energy, um, but they can also sell the excess energy they produce. So, and as a result, generate an income from that. So that was the way they made it kind of financially viable for people because otherwise um, there was people were actually like, obviously they have no access to electricity, but at the same time, they're not um, ready to pay for something which they think should be free as in the government or somebody should give them access for that anyway. So I think um, that, that's kind of like part of the reason why, you know, we are seeing a, like these frugal innovations kind of coming up that can address that like energy needs of the country. And, and a lot of times these innovations seem to be environmentally and, and climate friendly. Um, another example would be this small organization that's working in the Rohingya refugee camps um, because we got like, you know, almost half a million people uh, fr- from displaced um, refugees living, still living in the country. And again, because the part they're living in used to be a, like a natural forest, there are like no, no electricity grids there. There's no way to like bring energy to them. So there are these like small community level innovators who are doing things such as, okay, how can we um, generate energy from biomass uh, and maybe use recycled plastic as, as, as the container for, you know, for this um, storage system that would then lead to the energy generation. So we see like these like little bulbs being made from plastic bottles, um, things like that. So I think those kind of frugal innovations are coming up and those can definitely um, not only address the problem of energy access, but also make sure the energy generated is like more sustainable than what we have been using so far. Yeah, these are great examples, really, of uh, particularly in a place like Bangladesh, where there is high energy poverty, as you've mentioned, uh, to have really these solutions that can still be affordable and um, don't necessarily require big investments in renewable, countrywide renewable energy, for example, that could really be pricey. Um, and kind of what I was also thinking is just the general implementation of, of uh, policies that would um, apply globally. For example, I think Waco mentioned um, uh, carbon pricing. If you add cr- carbon price on products, then all of a sudden the price of that material would become more expensive. And then any consumers who are using consuming that globally would then also have to pay the price. And if we add, for example, in agriculture, which is one of the also a leading uh, a, a carbon emitter emitting industry. Uh, if there's a carbon tax that is added uh, globally, then um, any um, uh, 
individuals working in the agricultural industry anywhere in the world, including the most in the poorest nations, will also be impacted negatively. And then they will also be losing their jobs. And then they would require retraining from government. So it becomes quite a bit of a, of a difficult predicament from a, a policy perspective. And if I could um, maybe uh, return um, um, to Alco for a second, in terms of your work on the lithium um, um, uh, experience of lithium mining, kind of just giving this example that I've just shared of, of negative impacts of, for example, carbon uh, uh, tax on agriculture. How could we make from your work on lithium, are there examples that we could make then um, uh, that more of a positive experience and having more of a positive impact on the socio-environmental uh, level? So lithium mining is... Um... I suppose it is still carbon intensive the way that it's done now, whether it's brine extraction or whether it's hard rock extraction. Um, but the, the biggest issue is water consumption. And so right now, including with net zero, um, a lot of the focus has been on reducing carbon decarbonization and rightly so. Um, but there is a risk in when we're focusing just on carbon that we're causing issues in other areas, whether it's human rights, threat to biodiversity or water depletion. In the case of lithium, lithium is mostly um, battery grade lithium is mostly mined in Chile. And that is this this process would be about using 50,000 litres of water per day. Um, and then evaporating 98% of the water through solar evaporation. And then that is done in an area where there is no water. And so you can imagine what kind of impact this has on local communities who no longer have the water to grow their food. Um, they don't, they have to actually move um, because of this, because of these impacts. So lithium has uh, carbon impacts, but also water intensity, also toxic waste emission. Um, however, I think more so in terms of it, than financial, there are technological um, innovation in, in lithium. For example, the direct lithium extraction is a method to extract lithium without using solar evaporation um, and uses less water, uses less energy. This has actually been done, for example, in Germany um, at the moment. And um, it is more expensive because you can imagine solar evaporation would be cheap because it's just using the energy from the sun. Um, so all of this innovation is very new, um, more expensive, perhaps, uh, an investment, um, but they, they do help with this transition. So right now, it's almost like we've got a third tier of mining emerging between the artisanal scale and the large scale. And that middle is sort of similar to maybe the regenerative agriculture in the agriculture field, whereas here it's kind of like low carbon, low water mining. And mining has a terrible um, reputation, of course, but I think with a lot of technology right now and um, a lot of changes in mining projects, of course, not large ones that we know of, but there are very small modular projects going on that actually improve the environment. So, for example, the Eden project in Cornwall, they look at um, they put greenhouses on what used to be a mining area. Um, there are some projects that use um, byproducts of previously mined places. And um, there are also policies in mining um, that were proposed to ensure that mining companies are responsible for that area after they've left. And this is something that not a lot is not very common um, because it's just such a big uh, responsibility to take, but that really ensures that the mining companies are trying to improve what they are doing. And um, um, yeah, and just also to caveat, when I say mining, I'm talking about rare earth, rare metal, um, mining that's used for um, renewable energy. Right. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, that's. I think this is part of the the, the real difficulty here is even with lithium, as, as that you've been um, giving examples of. Lithium is also needed for for battery and uh, uh, and electricity or electric storage. So, uh, it's one of the the things that we need also to move away from fossil fuels and into more electrification and advancing uh, into net zero emissions. But um, the 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 focus of local mining uh, or the local responsibility of mining firms, I think, is really interesting because there's also um, in, for, you see it, for example, in, in Australia or even in Canada where mining firms are also using indigenous lands, for example. So their impact would also have an, even a, a larger um, uh, effect beyond the environmental um, issue. But you've mentioned as, um, repeatedly the role of, of, um, of technology and, and companies. And I think we're going back again to kind of where we started a little bit earlier of how do we then ensure that uh, companies how do we support private sector companies without affecting or harming their competitiveness, but actually offering them um, uh, uh, really incentives to encourage their investments in what you have mentioned is really pricey uh, uh, investments and in, in technology um, without um, really, well, without harming international trade and without harming uh, their competitiveness or even uh, encouraging carbon leakage. And what I mean by that is, you know, country kind of saying, all right, now there's a local decarbonization or climate rules in, in a country, then they move all their operations and they go to somewhere else where there's no uh, governmental uh, uh, rules on that. So by doing that, they're not really reducing less of emissions are basically going to another jurisdiction. So what could then be done at an international level from an international level first to really incentivize incentives and in, uh, uh, investments in, in technologies? Michael, I see you're, you're unmuted your mic. <laughs> yeah, I can come in a little bit on that. And, and maybe if there is a bright side on, on some of the geostrategic competition that we spoke about earlier, um, I think that there is a, a growing um, uh, a growing competition to under uh, to kind of um, establish a, a real foothold in the green energy transition, and so this is uh, this competition is is driving governments to uh, to to invest heavily in in the developing of uh, technologies that can uh, that can help facilitate their net uh, net zero commitments, um, and so um, perhaps this is this really is the key and, and to a to a significant extent to overcome the um, the famous blah blah blah. At, um, uh, response to to many of the international commitments, um, because really, you know, we have made these commitments, and now the the, the test will be will be actually taking measures to implement them. We're going to have a global stock take at. Uh, uh, COP28, I think it is, uh, where, where we're going to uh, progress. But but I think it, it, you know, there may be there may be a bright side here in in terms of uh, uh, creating a, a real incentive structure within national governments to to ensure that um, that countries are increasingly uh, controlling the the supply chains uh, and 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 facilitating the types of technological developments that are necessary uh, for the green energy transition. So subsidies. What what do you feel on, on subsidies then? I think I think that there are there are a variety of different different incentives. Whether uh, you know the the European Union is obviously looking at, at different um, uh, different mechanisms, market mechanisms, um, in, in, in terms of putting a price on carbon as well. Canada's mm -hmm. played, uh, played an important you know has developed a system in our own country, and it's not where where it also needs to be. But um, uh, but here uh, all of the uh, all of the the money that's that's taken goes goes back to uh, uh, to those communities, and so perhaps there's there's an international model. Um, the long hobby horse of many is, is some sort of automatic financing in the international system where, uh, where perhaps there, there could be some elaborate system that's, uh, that's developed to, to finance um, other countries and to, uh, and, and to do so in a, in a more automatic way. Um, this is very ambitious, obviously, uh, diplomatically and politically, but, um, but those, kinds of, those kinds of efforts and, and governments are, of course, incentivizing now to a very significant extent um, the um, uh, efforts to uh, to transition their economies to meet uh, their net zero commitments, um, and you know, there's there's no way around it that these you know that these types of technological developments are, are are absolutely fundamental to to actually meeting these commitments. We can't just keep going to these meetings, making commitments, and then and then failing to implement them. And so um, so I think that this is you know this is really where 
where this battle's you know against climate change is going to be won or lost. It's our ability to to actually uh, to actually implement these commitments, and then you know that that international infrastructure, the institutional piece that I've been speaking to, is really you know is is really I think a mechanism to coordinate a, um, a you know two hundred some odd countries' efforts to uh, to tackle these issues in an integrated way, and then to support those countries that that need support uh, both uh, both in terms of financing, but also in in terms of adaptation. Mm. And and within the 200 countries, we can also still have groups of countries that can collaborate and cooperate. I mean, we see the European Union as a very successful example in getting the European Green Deal or really funding a lot of uh, developments on the green uh, uh, energy across the, the, the European Union. Um, and that's very important because it provides costs for different um companies or, or, or reduces the cost really, but also it, it provides incentives for collaboration at the technology side, at the cost side, and even at the consumption side. Um, and um, um, you were mentioning a little bit earlier, I think, Michael, on um, different countries really joining the, the international scene. I mean, from the group of countries that I uh, work quite closely um, with or on, um, the uh, countries that export um, oil and gas and, and uh, fossil fuels, we see that for, for countries with the Gulf, for example, they uh, have been accused of being a climate obstructionist for a very long time in previous COPs. And then right before COP26, they uh, announced uh, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain announced net zero emission targets and also large investments in in, in technology to try to kind of catch up really with this large trend and and with the, um, I guess, the, also the geopolitical move. And, and, and there, of course, for them would be ensuring that they don't lose hold and because uh, currently they've had or historically had a, a, a leading role in the oil and gas world and now ensuring that they continue to have a leading role in the new energy, the energy transition world and and what that also then means to their economies as well, of course, to their to the livelihood and welfare of the populations and their industries and, and globally. But even there, I also think that there is room um, for um, collaboration across the region um, as well um, for a really uh, not just technological advancements, but also large um, hydrogen projects or large renewable energy projects, because I think that's the only way to, to have with economies of scale to reduce the cost of large production, because otherwise green energy would always be um, expensive and not necessarily competitive with fossil fuels unless we have carbon taxes and and so forth which then also become quite um, um expensive i'm not sure if anyone has a comment on that as well i think that 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 type of regional collaboration especially on transboundary energy projects for example and and countries that that perhaps have a uh, a common set of challenges, I think, uh, you know, in, in meeting the green energy transition. I think collaboration and, uh, and you know, the deeper and denser we can create those networks, uh, you know, integrated within the global infrastructure, but but uh, with with a strong regional uh, basis, I think is is really important. Um, not just in terms of advancing the the global diplomatic agenda, but also sending a consistent set of signals to market actors, uh, to sending a, a consistent set of of uh, targets where countries in you know demonstrate that they are really committed to doing this and then um, the the uh, industrial um, actors have the have the opportunity to uh, to have a, a a really clear set of expectations and, and an ability to plan in the 5 to 10 to 15 to 20 to 30 year uh, range that allows them to uh, to develop their businesses in the way that we we need them to and this is i think where we see um uh, multinational private sector corporations maybe more um, successful at kind of being able to overcome really boundaries in, in their operations and, and their policies in a way that maybe governments are still um, not um, up to, to speed at that level. And of course, the competition between countries and um, at different levels, not just geopolitical, but also technological um, and, and trade com competitiveness, all uh, fuel uh, fuel maybe their, um, their, uh, their competitiveness in this, but could also fuel maybe advancing faster um, the um, uh, development in, in green technology. And importantly, um, I was just thinking of, um, you know, we just almost out of the COVID-19 pandemic, not fully, but almost. Um, and interestingly that, despite the negative effect it had on the global uh, economy, it actually had a positive impact. Uh, it, it, it's accelerated investments in, in green technology. Um, um, and that was, we saw that more in, in the, 
richer um, developing uh, uh, economies, of course, but also in the larger multinationals across the world. And um, I uh, perhaps as we um, getting um, ready to maybe bring this very fascinating discussion to a close, um, perhaps I would, um, we've mentioned briefly the issue of climate justice. And I was wondering if I could get your thoughts on that. Obviously, um, the, 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 the topics we've covered are really multifaceted. They go from, you know, international organizations to domestic implementation, to nature-based solutions and community-based solutions, to private sector and technology, to socioeconomic impact. Um, but then this remains this issue of um, you know, um, I think Waco mentioned the, the global north and the global south. Unfortunately, that still remains quite a visible divide when it comes to um, to environmental uh, and climate sustainability issues. And again, where and who's more responsible for driving climate change versus who's really taking the hit in the most um, of, of, the, of having the most effects of climate change on them. And I was wondering, you know, your thoughts um, on that. I think between the four of us who've all been involved in um, either directly at different COP negotiations or even at international levels and uh, with, with UN uh, and UNFCCC level type discussions. So I'd welcome all of you to have to share your thoughts. Sahara, perhaps we could start with you if you'd like. Yeah, sure, uh, happy to. So I, I was actually thinking, I think um, with climate justice, like a closely linked issue is that of uh, loss and damage. And this mm -hmm. tends to be like the fact that how do you compensate countries for losses due to climate change induced, induced disasters that you cannot recover from essentially. And this has been a big part of our countries and many other countries, like this, especially the small island developing states um, agenda at the international climate negotiations. Like, is there a way to, you know, we still haven't really succeeded in kind of ensuring financing for loss and damage or having a clause in there for that. And I, I don't see that happening anytime soon. But I think that's definitely like the crux of the um, debate here and in many parts of the world about like, okay, how do we go ahead from here? Because I think there's a limit to how much, um, you know, these countries can do on their own. Um, and even if like it's, I, I don't think it's even an issue of blaming somebody just that, okay, given that the situation exists, how do we actually solve it? Um, even if the Western countries like, you know, even if we assume they, they aren't responsible for this, that doesn't change the fact that these countries are suffering and certain mm -hmm. countries are in a position to be able to help them. So even if you take out the whole blame game out of it, can you just do something? I think that's where the justice issue even like, you know, becomes stronger that um, can you step up and, you know, do something about this? So I think um, I, I would actually like, I think that the way you um, structure this narrative is very important in terms of taking this debate forward because it's a very thorny issue. And I think there are a lot of issues that are, you know, if you unpack this, the whole Pandora's box comes out about like, you know, what, what would reparations mean? Um, what else would you have to, you know, you know, be held accountable for um, because our history is pretty messy. So I think going ahead, uh, the whole justice issue would really come down to the, the country is really seeing the global picture as opposed to seeing it as like, okay, this is what's happening within my nation state's boundary and that doesn't concern me because ultimately climate change is gonna affect everybody. So I think if if that's the kind of long-term vision that global leaders have from now on, um, the justice issue would really be much easier to address. Yeah, it's about whether we're willing to pay the price that it would it would cost us to protect the rest of the world. And um, um, the, the private sector example with the mining companies is an example of trying private companies to do their role in that, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And I think when it comes to that, it's a big ask because um, you are saying that, you know, it basically all boils down to, in terms of that element, um, boils down to, okay, you are a new company um, that's entering this industry and you want to have very high sustainability targets. Well, is it is it fair for you to be a newcomer and then have to clean up another company's mess? You know, it, it kind of comes to these questions. And I think, especially when it comes to mining, um, it, it's very difficult because it just ends up being that all companies need to clean up the mess of other companies <laughs> um, or, or mining companies. Um, and so it, you're right, Zahar, like you, you can't play this blame game because ultimately we all end up, we all just have to accept the fact that we're going to clean up something that is not necessarily ours. Um, and I think 
in terms of that um, idea and in terms of those initiatives, um, that's kind of what it boils down to. But from the perspective of, of the uh, people most affected or the communities most affected, to them, they don't see it like that. They see it as well, uh, you know, even, for example, where most of the, you mentioned metals and, and uh, uh, mining in general, most of that has been, for example, of developing countries, of, of Latin America, of, of, uh, of Asia, of Africa. I mean, those, it's often really been colonizing nations that have also had access to that. So then you, it comes into, well, well, then you know, um, these previous colonialist power, then we patriot or, or compensate current countries for the losses over the years. And how do you measure that? And can you actually enforce that? And then it becomes really uh, difficult. Michael, what are your thoughts from a global level from the international organization side on climate justice, if any, or how yeah, can we move yeah. forward and address that? I mean, the, the issues are quite clear. Yeah, the issues are clear, and this is this is a, a I think a really really important and fundamental issue. At COP twenty six, we did we did make some progress, a, a commitment to uh, to double climate adaptation funding, um, though it was a bit fuzzy and, and woolly in places. That commitment, uh, some you know discussion for the first time of a loss and damages facility, and or you know some sort of mechanism to to begin to grapple with these issues. Um, I think what you know was said about the blame game. This is a really, really fraught and difficult issue. Uh, it absolutely is. If we're going to uh, proceed with a green transition, you know, just speaking from from a country that you know that would be would be considering this, it's it's already a tough tough ask politically to get uh, to get um, the governments to make the kinds of energy transitions that we need to. The costs can be very significant, as as has been discussed, and then um, to kind of uh, consider you know really really substantial kinds of funding um, out there. Is, is, is really challenging politically. Um, at the same time, you know, I think it was just last week we had the, the latest IPCC report on adaptation and, and um, you know, 40% of the world's population is highly vulnerable. That's 3.5 billion people that are highly vulnerable to this. Um, you know, I, I think it, there's, you know, African countries are uh, responsible for about 3% of global emissions, yet the, the impact on many, many countries and regions um, are, are really, really substantial. And so, um, this is, I think, a fundamental question. We opened the door a little bit at COP, but I think I think that there um, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done here to um, for the you know those that have been responsible historically for for this problem to uh, to come to grips with uh, with dealing with the consequences in a really in a really substantial way. And I think there really is a need for uh, for a far greater degree of of global solidarity and a real global ethic that needs to, to evolve around this to help these countries uh, meet the challenges that they're going to face in the coming decades. Um, and so, um, so I think, you know, at the right now there is, there's a need for a lot, a lot of further discussions, a lot greater clarity. I think, you know, if, if the greatest fears of Western countries are that this could be a kind of bottomless pit of once you get into loss and damage in terms of what, you know, what are we responsible for? So I think, I think that there really is an effort. There needs to be an effort to, to, to more clearly define this and then to, you know, to realize that there are real substantive challenges that, that many of, you know, much of the world's population, 3.5 billion people in this world are going to be facing. And, you know, how do we, how do we develop the solidarity that allows us to tackle that in a way that's just? Um, and then, of course, the the you know the related aspect is the intergenerational aspect of climate justice. That that I think um, we we also made some headways in the discussion recently on on that um, that uh, that we need to we need to consider as well uh, in terms of uh, sort of the longer term trajectory of all of this. And it's clear that we cannot really separate the issue of climate finance again from the issue of climate justice. And also in the negotiations, the climate justice issue was also one of the obstacles, perhaps, or the, the lack of climate justice, one of the obstacles in, in many countries saying we are not so ready to commit to uh, not uh, to phasing out fossil fuel production or consumption because it's what they depend on for their, it, 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 these industries employ millions of people and also they provide affordable uh, energy sources and we've mentioned this you know with the example of Bangladesh but in many other countries there's um, uh, still millions of people with without energy uh, access energy poverty remains a, a, a significant issue and clean energy unfortunately till now is more expensive um, in the absence of you know more global um, uh, efforts to 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 manage carbon pricing um, and uh, um, um, and, and basically the cost of any or even global carbon trading of sort. Um, and interestingly now, as we're speaking, 
energy prices are high because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So at the moment, everyone is potentially facing a problem with um, energy um, uh, poverty anyway. Um, this has been a very fascinating uh, discussion and it's been very multifaceted and I can keep talking uh, with you to the rest of the day, but unfortunately our time has come to close. Uh, thank you all so very much for these wonderful uh, insights that you provided us and uh, from the international and local and private and technology aspects of things. Um, and I thank you, thanks the listener for joining us today um, and um, um, Looking forward to uh, our next um, uh, webcast. Thank you all very much.